Inside that car is Alan Bucky, central figure in a major civil rights case, returning to his home in Los Altos, California tonight after winning his fight to enter medical school. I think it's just a reflection of what life is like in the United States today. It's a reflection of eight years of, of Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford, and it's a reflection of an American society which says we've given these people enough. Uh, they can sit in the front of the bus, they can sit downstairs in the movie theater, they can register to vote. Um, why aren't they happy with that? Uh, this will bring the civil rights movement back into focus where the majority of Americans can support it. And, and that's uh, going to be a real plus, I think, for the uh, long term in this country. My general view is that affirmative action has been enhanced. That's what I told the president. And he was pleased to know that. Uh, whether you lose five to four, uh, uh, eight to one, uh, uh, seven to zero, when it's all said and done in the ninth inning, you've lost a great decision. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention. Landmark Cases, C-SPAN's special history series, produced in partnership with the National Constitution Center, exploring the human stories and constitutional dramas behind 12 historic Supreme Court decisions. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, Good evening and welcome to C-SPAN's Landmark Cases. Tonight, affirmative action. In 1978, the Supreme Court issued its first opinion on this issue in what's known as the Bakke case. The court's complex decision, the UC Davis Medical School's affirmative action program was declared unconstitutional, while the concept overall was deemed legal, has left the court and the country wrangling for decades over affirmative action. Two guests are here tonight who will help us understand the history and the legacy of this case. Both of them teach at Georgetown Law School, but with very differing legal philosophies. Let me introduce them to you. Neil Katyal was a former acting Solicitor General under President Obama. He argued 13 cases as Solicitor General and 37 cases on the court overall. He clerked for Justice Stephen Breyer, and he is today a partner at the Hogan Lovells Law Firm in D.C. Randy Barnett is also director of Georgetown Center for the Constitution, argued one important case before the Supreme Court, and is uh, the author uh, most recently of Our Republican Constitution, Securing the Liberty and Sovereignty of We the People, published in 2016. Well, gentlemen, in that opening historic newscast with Dan Rather, we heard uh, two very divergent views of affirmative action, both its uh, execution and its value for our society. What are your views as we get started here? Randy Barnett? Well, I think that this case was a landmark case. It deserves to be in your landmark series because it basically set the agenda that we live in today. All the talk that we've heard about diversity, everyone who's grown up uh, in the last 30, 40 years have heard about diversity and, you know, on end, it, it, it never ends talking about diversity. Diversity comes from this case and Justice Powell's opinion when it became the rationale that allowed um, racial preferences to be used. And so we've been talking about diversity ever since this case. Neil Katyal. Well, first of all, it's a joy to be here with both of you on this all Georgetown panel. Um, and, uh, you know, I agree with you entirely, Randy, and I'm not sure I'll be saying that all night, but right now, for, the, for what you just said, you're absolutely right. Bakke did set the terms of the debate and put the diversity rationale for affirmative action front and center. And the debates we've had ever since are all microcosms of what you just saw in that little run-up that was played in the clips. This is a 14th Amendment case. So I'm going to remind our viewers here in our 12th and final program in this series uh, of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So what aspect of Bakke makes it a 14th Amendment case? Well, it's considered to be an equal protection case uh, because the allegation made by Alan Bakke was that um, he was denied the equal protection of the law by the Regents of California and the California, UC Davis uh, Medical School um, because uh, he was uh, excluded from UC Davis Medical School on the count of his race. Uh, and that made it an equal protection case under the cases that had come up to that point. Uh, Neil Katyal, we're going to listen to our first piece of video of the program, and it's uh, two justices in very narrow time frame, Justice Scalia in 2016 and Sotomayor in 2017, both talking about affirmative action, and then come back to you for your thoughts. Let's listen. 
There are those who contend that it does not benefit African Americans to, to get them into the University of Texas where they do not do well, uh, as opposed to having them go to a less uh, advanced school, a, less, a, a slower track school where they do well. I, I, one, one of the briefs uh, uh, pointed out that, uh, that most of the, most of the black uh, scientists in this country don't come from schools like the University of Texas. So th- this they court come from lesser schools where they do not feel uh, that they're uh, that they're being pushed ahead in, in classes that are too too fast for them. I was a law student. One of my dearest friends invited me to a law firm dinner. They were recruiting at the law school, and he introduced me as Sonia Sotomayor, um, a graduate of Princeton, who had come from the South Bronx and and. Um, was doing whatever I was doing at the time. And everybody got introduced, and the partner sitting across from me looks at me and said, did you get into Yale because of affirmative action? He hadn't seen my resume yet. (laughs) And I looked at him and I said, it might have helped. But I also think graduating summa cum laude Phi Beta Kappa of Princeton with its highest academic honor had a little bit to do with it, too. Well, Justice Scalia was one of our leading lights on the judiciary. There's no doubt about that. But even he made mistakes. And I think he was roundly criticized for what he said in that oral argument. Um, And criticized, I think, not just because it was factually wrong, but because it really misstated the true rationale for affirmative action, which comes back to what we're talking about today, the Bakke case. Because in the Bakke case, the rationale for affirmative action that survived and that has become the template for affirmative action programs all over the country is not, oh, we're trying to benefit some minority. It's rather we're trying to benefit everyone through a diversity of experiences in the classroom and outside the classroom. And, you know, it's that rationale that, um, you know, conservative-funded litigation has tried to knock out for years and has never really done a particularly good job at getting rid of. Well, Justice Scalia, in that uh, in that excerpt, it was not his finest moment in how he articulated the point. He was trying to articulate what's called the mismatch theory, which is that people need to be admitted to schools uh, that they're more qualified for because they'll do better in those schools. They'll graduate more frequently. They'll actually it'll actually be beneficial to everyone if they're matched. That's what he was trying to articulate. I, I thought the Sotomayor um, uh, excerpt was kind of interesting because it suggested that she was a little sensitive about being characterized as an affirmative action admit. Uh, she said, well, it might have helped, so she didn't deny it. But on the other hand, she wanted to assert that uh, that might not have been the major reason she was admitted. So why not? I think why not is the reason that Justice Thomas has said repeatedly in his opinions in this area, and that is there is a potential stigma attached to all minorities uh, because some minorities are admitted under affirmative action programs that some will then say means they're less qualified. And I thought that uh, that she manifested a bit of sensitivity on that subject. And, and as will athletes when they are condemned for, you know, you got in because you play football or legacy admissions or so many other things. The idea that that should take off the table and make it, what we're talking about here is federal courts coming in and saying, you university, it's unconstitutional for you to do this. Even if you deeply believe it, we're taking it off the table. You can't do it. Um, and, you know, that's a nice policy debate that should be had at every university. Does it stigmatize or not? But the idea that somehow that this makes this unconstitutional, I think, is a very tough argument. And, and I agree with that. Uh, I think, actually, Neil and I are going to be agreeing about a lot tonight. And I do agree that that goes both for the mismatch theory that Justice Scalia was talking about and for this stigma idea that Justice Sotomayor was hinting at. These go to whether the policy is a good policy or not. They may or may not be relevant to whether the policy is constitutional or not. And we need to keep those two issues straight. Let's go to some of the roots of affirmative action. First of all, the definition of it, uh, an active effort to improve the employment or educational opportunities of of members of the minority groups and women, or to promote the rights or progress of other disadvantaged persons. That's just a dictionary definition. But now we'll learn more about the policy 
uh, definitions of it. The first time we heard reference to it was in 1961 in an executive order from President Kennedy requiring affirmative action from government contractors to hire minorities. So what happened through the 60s uh, and, and going forward uh, with the, the government's uh, interest in uh, giving people a leg up because of their gender or their race? Well, I'm old enough to remember, although I was kind of young in the 60s, but I'm old enough to remember that affirmative action actually had a somewhat different valence when it was first introduced into popular discourse. It was really about engaging in affirmative acts to go out and recruit um, uh, people who, were, had been pre who had been previously excluded, because we all know that we tend to admit people that are like ourselves, and uh, we tend to see, we tend to talk to the same people and recruit from the same places, and we should actually affirmatively, if we want to have an integrated society, we should affirmatively go out and identify qualified people and then uh, uh, make an effort to recruit them and hire them. Uh, that's what the affirmative action part meant. It didn't necessarily mean preferential treatment or differential standards. Um, and it came to mean that, uh, for better or for worse, it came to mean that, I think, more la later on. Uh, but I think, um, I think it's important to realize that you can engage in affirmative action um, uh, without engaging with preferences. I mean, Neil was chair of the appointments committee that uh, hired me at Georgetown. And uh, it took some affirmative action on his part um, for that to happen, both to recruit me and to uh, get me through the faculty. One and of my I, proudest moments at Georgetown. And I'll always be grateful for it. Um, uh, and I would count that as affirmative action on his part. Um, so it's not to say that preferences are excluded as part of the package, only that affirmative action shouldn't be limited to preferences. So there was one earlier case in 1974 uh, that involving the University of Washington Law School, but the court did something called it ruling it moot. What does that really mean? What happened so, there? So mootness means that the case has gone away because of a change in circumstances, and it happens all the time. It happened to me this year in the travel ban case um, when I was bringing it to the Supreme Court the second time around. Uh, President Trump changed the travel ban a couple weeks before the oral argument, and then his solicitor general, his top lawyer, sent something in suggesting the case had basically gone away. It would have been moot, changed by circumstances, because it was a new one. And similarly here, in this Defunis case in 1974, the court said, you know, there's a change in circumstances. I believe the person had graduated or something. And so for that reason, the case has gone away. Court, you don't need to hear it. And I think one of the kind of fundamental lessons about the U.S. Supreme Court is that they don't ever, almost ever, have to do anything. And so they often do mo a lot by doing very little, by deciding not to do something. That itself is leaving the democratic conversation to unfold. And so in 1974, you have to understand this is a very rapid period of change at the U.S. Supreme Court and in society more generally. So just two decades before, you have Brown versus Board of Education, which defines really what the Warren Court is all about. And then from there, you have Warren uh, coming off the court, replaced by Chief Justice Berger. And indeed, President Nixon nominates, just in his first three years of his term, four justices to the Supreme Court. So by 1974, you really have a change in the way the court, uh, the, the composition of the court. And so it's not surprising when you have something like that, that sometimes the court's not going to necessarily going to get into a hot button issue until they really have to. And so by declaring the case moot, they let the conversation unfold. They let lower courts hear more of these. Here, this case, the Bakke case, was going on in the California state court system. There were other cases going on. That's a very common thing for the Supreme Court to do. We always set the stage with the characters that you're going to hear throughout our 90 minutes. So here's the group uh, you'll be hearing about. First of all, the regents of the University of California, who are the governing body, of course, for the school. And in, in fact, in, uh, they opened a new medical school at UC Davis in 1968. First class was all right. To remedy that, uh, by the time the Bakke case came around, 16% of the seats had been set aside for special committee admission. Uh, Alan Bakke himself was, at the time, 35 years old, a former Marine Corps officer and an engineer who decided his calling was really medicine. He applied to other medical schools, Northwestern and University of Southern California among them, but was rejected because of his age. Justice Lewis Powell, what should people know about Lewis Powell? Well, Lewis Powell was a man of the South, for one thing. Um, and that actually was something that uh, rankled um, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall a little bit um, during the deliberations on this particular case. Um, uh, so 
getting him to come around and uh, essentially be the deciding vote on this case was actually a, a major accomplishment uh, for the advocates of affirmative action. Another important member of this uh, cast uh, tonight is Justice Thurgood Marshall. What should people know about him? Well, probably the most legendary lawyer um, in, you know, 200 years. Uh, you know, maybe but, you know, Daniel Webster can give him a run for his money, but that's about it. Um, you know, created a litigation strategy that led to Brown versus Board of Education, became our first African American Solicitor General, uh, was a judge on the Second Circuit, a Court of Appeals in New York, and then our first, obviously, African American Justice on the Supreme Court, um, and a legendary heroic figure. We visited the Library of Congress and their archives uh, on, on legal matters. And you're going to hear from Ryan Reft next, uh, showing us a letter written to the NAACP from Justice Marshall. Let's watch. So we are in the Madison building of the Library of Congress. What we have here is a collection of documents from a variety of papers, personal papers, and organizational records pertaining to Thurgood Marshall. This letter written by Thurgood Marshall to Ms. Juanita E. Jackson, Special Assistant to the Secretary of NAACP in July of 1936. The reason for this letter is to draw attention to his victory in Murray v. Pearson, which was a state appeals Maryland case, in which Donald Murray had applied to admission to Maryland Law School and had been denied, just as Thurgood Marshall had been denied years earlier. The role of the letter is to draw attention to the fact that Marshall had been working with Charles Hamilton Houston, who had trained him at Howard Law School, uh, and they had been laying the groundwork for a kind of new approach to desegregation by dismantling segregation statute by statute. Law school, in particular, was one means to do that. And by working with Hamilton Houston and drawing the NAACP's attention to this issue, they hoped to, one, demonstrate that Marshall had gained a significant victory here, two, that this strategy for desegregation would be effective, and three, I think also Hamilton Houston's already working for the NAACP, and this is a means to maybe advertise Marshall's kind of bona fides and to draw him in later, which happens about a year or two later, and he becomes a central actor in these efforts. So his own experience, background, and the cases that he'd been involved with all come to bear as he brings it to Absolutely. the Bakke argument. Uh, let's tell you a little bit more about uh, Alan Bakke's credentials as he applied for medical school. He was number 468 out of 500 in the score on the admissions rating scale, 3.46 undergraduate GPA, and scored in the 97th percentile on the medical college admissions test. That was uh, 72. UC Davis average was 69. Um, he applied twice, and once in 1973 and again in 1974, and rejected both times. And the second rejection was what started the legal challenge. Um, I want to ask about the age factor, though. So uh, it sounds like he could have easily have pursued this on an age discrimination basis. Well, this is before age was considered any kind of a suspect classification that could be challenged, and or before there was any protective civil rights laws on the basis of age discrimination. Um, and he was actually told by not UC Davis, by but by another law school that he interviewed with, another medical school. I'm probably going to make that mistake more than once by another medical school that he interviewed with that uh, his age gave, uh, made it an uphill struggle for him to get admitted to that, that school. He had uh, completed engineering school. He was actually supposed to be a first-rate engineer. He had done not only a Marine Corps but a combat tour in the Marines before he decided that he really wanted to do medicine. And you would think that with all that going for him that medical schools would welcome him, but it wasn't only UC Davis, it was uh, all the medical schools that he applied to uh, did not welcome him, and I think uh, he thought, and I think he was right, that age had a lot to do with it. And, and I guess I'd say one other thing, you know, struck as I was reading the briefs uh, to the Supreme Court in the Bakke case, that the university made a conscious decision not to go after Bakke in any way, shape, or form. They actually were, the California Supreme Court said, hey, you know, maybe he wouldn't have gotten admitted anyway. Shouldn't we send it back? And the university said, no, we will stipulate, which means we'll concede he should have, he would have gotten in but for this affirmative action program. And I know in this day and age in which, you know, frankly, so many people demonize the other side, I was very struck by the tone that the university took toward him at every turn, showing him respect, then saying, look, we have a principled reason for affirmative action, but, you know, they didn't go after Alan Bakke. By the same token, and you're going to see this in another clip that you're going to show, Alan Bakke did not use this platform to make some kind of issue or cause out of this for himself. He avoided the limelight uh, 
during the entire litigation and every day since the litigation. Um, and so that's not that's something else that we don't see mm -hmm. nowadays, where everybody wants to to be famous, and being a, a being a, a, an important plaintiff in a big lawsuit would make you famous. Right. So after the California Supreme Court decision came down, they had the option: Do we ask the United States Supreme Court to hear it? Now, ordinarily, if you have a state court decision, the U.S. Supreme Court can't hear it because it's about state law issues, and the U.S. Supreme Court says, "Look, California courts, you know California law." We don't know California law or whatever other state. But here, the California Supreme Court decided a federal issue. And because of that, they were able to, the university was able to go and say, hey, Supreme Court, hear our case. And to do that, you have to file something called, it's got a long Latin term, petition for a writ of certiorari. That's, I, Supreme Court, am asking you to hear my case. And, you know, today there are about 8,000, 9,000 of those petitions every year. The Supreme Court grants about 65 of them. So the odds are, are very low of getting your case heard before the Supreme Court. But obviously in a case of importance, that matters. Um, and in a case in which the country is divided and the lower courts are divided, that can obviously help. So here that's what the university did. They filed a petition to say, hear our case. Now, what's interesting about the petition is... Um, you know, it's uh, and it's not a petition that really tees up what we now think of as Baki. What we now think of as Baki is the diversity rationale, people learning from each other. But when you write a cert petition, you actually write the very first page is the question presented. You're asking the Supreme Court to answer a question. And the question they said was the following. When only a small fraction of thousands of applicants can be admitted, does the Equal Protection Clause forbid a state university professional law school faculty from voluntarily seeking to counteract the effects of generations of pervasive discrimination against discrete and insular minorities by establishing a limited special admissions program that increases opportunities for well-qualified members of such racial and ethnic minorities? Now, that's a handful. It's it sure a long is. question. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, what it's saying at the end is, can we have affirmative action to remedy the societal effects of past discrimination. So we're making up for abuses at some earlier point in time. That's not affirmative action after Baki. Afterwards, it's we're not trying to make something up. We're just trying to improve the diversity inside and outside the classroom. Uh, so here's what the court looked like in 1978. Uh, and the, the newest justice was a Ford appointee, John Paul Stevens. Nixon appointees were the Chief Justice Warren Berger, Harry Blackman, Lewis Powell, and William Rehnquist. Uh, earlier, uh, Johnson appointees, Thurgood Marshall. The Kennedy appointee, uh, Wizard White, Byron White, was still on the court. And still two Eisenhower appointees, William Brennan and Potter Stewart. This was the ninth year with uh, Warren Berger as the Chief Justice. Is there anything notable about the Burger Court in terms of its uh, racial decisions, uh, things that involving the minorities in the country? Well, as, as Neil already alluded to, President Nixon had made a number of appointments to the court by this time, including Warren Burger, and as a result, the valence of the political valence of the court substantially changed um, from the Warren Court, uh, which was what we might call a progressive court, um, and to uh, a more conservative court, but a court that was not sort of um, uh, rigidly conservative. It was just a pullback or retrenchment from the Warren Court. So, yeah, it is actually quite significant. I think um, we would associate the position of the four justices um, uh, who were uh, aligned with Justice Marshall in this case with what the Warren Court would have been expected to do. But because we are now in the Burger Court, that's not what we get. And we, don't, we also don't get a complete abandonment of affirmative action either for this court. What we get is that middle ground that, that, Powell, that Justice Powell represented, that sort of characteristic of the kind of middle ground you ultimately got from the Burger Court. You're listening to C-SPAN's Landmark Cases. We will be back in a moment. We're going to listen to some of uh, the oral arguments. First, a reminder of what the, in, in a boiled down fashion, what the two major questions were before the court. First of all, is race-based affirmative action constitutional? And secondly, is the University of California's quota-based affirmative action constitutional? Uh, so let's hear Archibald uh, Cox's arguments. Uh, these were held on October 12, 1977, and there were two hours of arguments 
uh, which is a little bit longer than usual. Normally now it's one. Do we know why there were two hours in this particular case? Uh, sometimes they'll expand argument. You know, I've certainly had that happen in major cases in which they want more. And here we knew there were going to be three litigants, not two, because of the United States Solicitor General, um, who appears in, you know, one-third of all arguments. But this was a particularly important one. Who was Archibald Cox? Well, Archibald Cox was a uh, famous uh, Harvard Law professor. Uh, he actually, after he retired, uh, w joined the faculty as an emeritus uh, at Boston University. His office was next to mine when I was on the faculty of Boston University. So I heard that voice occasionally coming from his office. So he was very well known, and he's best known to the general public for having been the special prosecutor uh, who was appointed to investigate Watergate uh, and eventually was fired uh, by Robert Bork, as a matter of fact, when, when President Nixon uh, was opposing uh, Cox's use of a subpoena to try to get the Watergate tapes, the famous tapes that the Nixon administration had, that, that Nixon himself had made. Um, and then he was eventually replaced by Leon Jaworski, a different special prosecutor. But that made Arthur, Archibald Cox, who was at that point, you know, a somewhat obscure Harvard law professor, to the general public, a, a, a household name. And he might become a household name again. We're going to listen in as uh, he makes some of his arguments before the court in Regents versus Bakke. The objective that uh, impresses itself on my mind, uh, partly because uh, Dean Lowry testified it, partly because I am uh, at least in part an educator, is the importance of including young men and women at both undergraduate colleges and the medical schools so that they, other younger boys and girls, may see, yes, it is possible uh, for a black to go to University of Minnesota or to go to Harvard or Yale. Uh, this is essential if we are ever going to give true equality in a factual sense to people, because the existence or non-existence of opportunities, uh, surely we all know, uh, shapes people's aspirations when they're very young. Mr. Cox, uh, what if uh, Davis Medical School had decided that since the po uh, population of doctors in the, uh, among the minority population of doctors in California was so small, uh, instead of setting aside 16 seats for minority doctors, they would set aside 50 seats until that balance were redressed and the minority population of doctors equaled that of the uh, pop, uh, population as a whole. Would that be any more infirm than the program that Davis has? Well, I think my answer is this. There is no reason to condemn a program uh, because of the particular number chosen. Randy Barnett, what do you think of his argument? I like that. I think my answer is this. It sounded like he was thinking about what his answer was when he said that, Definitely. actually. Uh, and also was struck by the argument. I, I actually listened to the whole argument uh, in preparation for the show, and I was struck by how the justices let him talk without interruption for great expanses of time. They treated him the way the Solicitor General is often treated in oral argument. Uh, yeah, very, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> very deferentially, um, as opposed to his opponent, who was actually peppered quite uh, serious, uh, very heavily with questions. So, he got to, you heard that long excerpt. Well, that's a long excerpt. We, you don't hear that much anymore. At the beginning or the end of argument even, you don't hear any advocate in almost any contested case get that much time to speak. Yeah, and I guess I'd say two things about that. Number one, the reason why that is is not anything about affirmative action. It's all because of one guy we were talking about earlier, Antonin Scalia. It, you listen to, you can, your public can listen to any oral argument on oyez.org, O-Y-E-Z.org, um, and you can just type in Brown or whatever case you want to listen to. And after 1986, when Justice Scalia gets on the court, oral argument becomes a very different thing. Before that, you could go up with, you know, almost a speech or something like that. Now I go up with, like, one line on a legal pad and hope I get that one line out before I get my first question. So that's the first thing. The second is, you know, you heard um, then-Justice Rehnquist ask that question to Mr. Cox. And, and um, Rehnquist was a fabulous questioner, just phenomenal. And, you know, th that question typifies a lot of Supreme Court argument, which is, they are, the justices are trying to say, okay, I've read your brief, but how far does the logic of your position extend to? And so they come up with hypotheticals like, okay, it's not 16 out of 50 seats, it's 50 out of 50 seats. Does your argument still hold? Why not? 
What are the logical limits to your position? Um, and that's really what the art of Supreme Court advocacy is all about. And, and, Co and Cox was reading that speech, and I know that because at some point he skipped a line, and then it threw him off, and he had to go back and get oh that line up. And so I know that he read <laughs> oh his speech. So I uh, hear his a bit of uh, the other side. Ronald Colvin was a San Francisco attorney who argued on behalf of Alan Bakke, the only case that he argued before the Supreme Court. Let's listen. So you, uh, part of your submission is, even if these are compelling interests, even if there's no alternative, use of the racial classification is unconstitutional. We believe that it's unconstitutional. We well, do. Is we that do. because it's limited rigidly to 16? No, not because it's limited to 16, but because the concept of race itself as a classification becomes in, in our history and in our understanding an unjust and improper basis upon which to judge people. We do not believe that intelligence, that achievement, that ability are measured by skin pigmentation or by the last surname of an individual, whether or not it sounds Spanish. Well, do, you mean, do you mean by that that as to the 16 places, the allocation was dominantly uh, by race? Oh, there's no question but what the 16 places was dominantly by race. The, and and I record. have to go back to the record, if I may, just, just to reach that point. There were no non-minority people who were ever admitted to the special admission program. And I do not mean that that was for the lack of trying. So, Neil Katyal, what do you hear there? Well, you know, it's always tough to argue before the Supreme Court, and it's particularly tough if it's your first time, as it was for Mr. Colvin. I do want to say, you know, I'm joined by a person on this panel who, in his first argument, did a magnificent job. <laughs> and everyone should listen to it. It's, it's a rare thing, you know, to do it, pull it off in your first time. So my, you know, my sympathies go out to Mr. Colvin because the whole argument, you know, really, I think, didn't go the way that he kind of hoped it would. Um, uh, he there. Won the case. <laughs> um, well, won it in, in a way, yes, um, uh, yes, but um, but I, I don't think it was because of the argument at the end of the day, um, as the tally sheet shows from the votes um, on certiorari before the argument. So, um, you know, I do hear, you know, I think all through the litigation, the strategy of Bakke was to say this is a quota. There are 16 slots that no one else can get except minorities. And that was a powerful argument, and that was probably his best moment in the argument, what you just heard. And so we're going to look at how that decision turned out. It was, in fact, split on the two questions. Uh, affirmative action is constitutional was a majority of uh, Justices Powell, Brennan, White, Marshall, and Blackman. And on the question of whether or not the UC Davis program was constitutional, the answer, no. Powell... Berger, Stewart, Rehnquist, Stevens. There were also five concurrences and dissents, and so it was a very complicated real outcome. Um, I want to go through this because our time's getting short and, and put some of the excerpts, and then we can talk about what it all means. Uh, first of all, on question one, is race-based affirmative action constitutional? This was a 5-4 regarding uh, that question. And here is an excerpt from Justice Powell's majority opinion. The court today affirms the constitutional power of federal and state governments to act affirmatively to achieve equal opportunity for all. Government may take race into account when it, is, when it acts not to demean or insult any racial group, but to remedy disadvantages cast on minorities by past racial prejudice. And uh, here is uh, Stephen's dissent ex excerpt signed on to by Berger, Stewart, and Rehnquist. It is therefore perfectly clear that the question whether race can ever be used as a factor in an admissions decision is not an issue in this case, and that discussion of that issue is inappropriate. The meaning of the Title VI ban on exclusion is crystal clear. Race cannot be the basis of excluding anyone from a federally funded program. Okay, let's talk about the uh, opinions on that question. What should people take away from that? Well, there were two issues uh, in the case. The principal one was the constitutional issue, but there was always the statutory issue as well. And um, there were some justices, and it turns out to be four justices, who would prefer to have decided this case on statutory grounds, on Title VI grounds, than on the constitutional grounds. There was some issue as to whether there was even an individual, whether an individual could assert a cause of action under Title VI that bothered some of the justices. Um, I think it was Potter Stewart that bothered the most. 
Um, at any rate, um, they, as you say, the court eventually decided, I mean, Justice Powell, siding with the four uh, uh, more liberal justices, did reach the constitutional question, and affirmative action was upheld, uh, but it was upheld in a way that would have to avoid quotas, whatever that might be, and that was the dance that was then, that we've been engaged in ever since then. When, when is something a quota, and when is it a goal or something other than a quota? Um, and and, and, it, and it's, it's this case that put us into that situation. Yeah, and maybe to just back up a little bit and just talk about, you know, so there are nine justices on the court, and, you know, at the end of an oral argument, like a day or two later, the nine will go meet in a conference room, and no one else will be there except the nine justices, and they will go around the table and say how they tentatively vote in a case. And ordinarily, it's a decision that is, you know, some people in the majority and some in the dissent. You know, sometimes you're unanimous and, you know, oftentimes in which they all agree. But sometimes with a nine-member body, you get these weird things happen in which you've got, like this case, you've got four justices. Affirmative action violates the statute. Four justices, affirmative action is totally cool. One justice saying, well, it's only kind of cool. It's that one justice's opinion that actually controls the court because it's the narrowest ground of decision on which every you know on which a majority of the court agrees. And so here, that narrow decision, narrow rationale, was by Justice Powell. And yes, he only got one vote, but boy, was it an influential vote. Because you know sometimes you're the only justice, but if you say something right, it ultimately takes off. Justice Scalia did it in the Independent Counsel Act. Justice Rehnquist did it on federalism issues in the 1970s. And here you've got Powell doing it here. He said something that spoke to the lived experience in universities, and administrators picked up on that and understood what it meant. There is one little twist on the story here, and that is Justice Blackman was having prostate surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and so he wasn't present for the conference, the first conference. And they didn't really know how this case was going to come out until he got back. And then they were able to get him to give an opinion. And even in the beginning, when he got back, he didn't want to give him an opinion. And finally, I think it was the chief justice who had to go into his chambers and said, are you ready to tell us how you're going to vote yet? And he said, not yet. And then eventually he did. And then, to some, the surprise of some members of the court, he actually did side at that point with the liberal side of the court. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the second question, which is about the University of California's quota-based affirmative action system, finding that it was not constitutional. It was a 5-4 decision again. Uh, and here is an excerpt from Justice Powell's majority opinion in question two. The special admissions program is undeniably a classification based on race and ethnic background. The guarantee of equal protection cannot mean one thing when applied to one individual and something else when applied to a person of another color. If both are not accorded the same protection, then it is not equal. And from Justice Marshall's dissent on this question, he writes, it is more than a little ironic that after several hundred years of class-based discrimination, discrimination against Negroes, the court is unwilling to hold that a class-based remedy for that discrimination is permissible. Comments? Yeah, so this quota, this kind of remedial view of affirmative action does not command a majority of the court, despite Justice Marshall's passion on the issue. And so as a result, Justice Powell's opinion, which says no quotas, but you can engage in diversity-based affirmative action, which looks at the whole person and allows every person to compete for every slot. That's okay. What was wrong with the University of California system was that it told people 16 out of 100 slots, you can't apply if you're Caucasian. You don't get to even a chance at those. And that, Justice Powell said, was wrong. And I think that's where the heart of the country was and is today. Justice uh, Marshall's uh, view that you just quoted from us represents one side of the two different versions of discrimination and race that separate the court even today. And this is the way I teach the court, the ca this, these sets of cases. On the one hand, you have Justice Marshall and the liberals today on the court who say what's banned by the 14th Amendment is what they call invidious discrimination, discrimination that is actually aimed at demeaning or undermining or subordinating one group of people. And what's not banned by the 14th Amendment is what you might call benign discrimination, discrimination intended to help. The difference between what Justice Stevens would later call a no trespass sign and a welcome mat. Um, on the other side of the court, with, represented by Justice Thomas, and it was then Justice Scalia, is the view that reuse of race is 
uh, uh, in classifications other than to, reme to, to remedy a violation perpetrated by the party before the court, uh, like the University of California had it done, had it a history of this. The use of race is so uh, so insidious that it should simply not be used as a classification at all. And even if you think you're using it benignly, you may not actually be using it benignly. And that is the divide that separated the court then, and it's the divide I think that separates the court today. Let's move on to what happened to Alan Bakke. First of all, uh, we're going to play a uh, clip that answers some of that question, and then talk more about what happened in his life. The public knows little about him, and that's because Alan Bakke wants to remain as unknown as possible. In what is believed to be his first interview ever, we spoke today about the decision and about his penchant for privacy. I'm pleased with the decision, and that's all I intend to comment about it. Why haven't you spoken out before? Uh, uh, it's my personal preference to uh, not to speak publicly about the case. I like to keep my private life private. Oh, but you know, it, it's not a private matter when it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. My own personal life is private, and I intend to keep it that way. Do you plan to go to medical school? Uh, yes, I do plan to go in the fall. One other note, an update from the University of California, Davis. Ninety-seven medical students graduated there today, among them Alan Bakke, who made headlines in the 70s by challenging the university's racial quota system. Bakke had charged he was denied admission in favor of minority students who scored lower on entrance exams. Ultimately, the Supreme Court in a landmark decision ruled in his favor. Dr. Bakke began serving his residency at the Mayo Clinic in July. And as we heard, he became a doctor, uh, did both a residency and a fellowship at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. Bakke worked for many years, the rest of his career, as an anesthesiologist in Minnesota retired about a decade ago and then moved on to medical devices uh, as a business venture. But just as Powell said, you know, sometimes the best decision is a compromise decision, not the extreme on either side. And, you know, in our country that's so divided right now, I think Justice Powell's kind of just method of listening to both sides and trying to come up with something that gives everyone something was, I think, a really instructive lesson for us all. So we're just about out of time. I want to thank both of you for being uh, at the table, two terrific guests to end our series, uh, Landmark Cases, and okay. thanks for helping us understand this complex decision and really how our society continues to grapple with this. Thank you, thank Susan. You. Thanks. Um, as we've been telling you, this is our final uh, of 12 cases for this season of Landmark Cases, so a couple of thank yous, if you'll permit me, at the end. First of all, veteran Supreme Court reporter Tony Morrow, who wrote uh, the companion book with the 12 cases outlined for this series, as he did for season one. And then also the uh, folks at the National Constitution Center who are our partners in this series. You see the people who helped research the cases and many of the guests along there with the president of the Constitution Center, Jeff Rosen, who was himself a guest on one of our earlier programs. And finally, let me show you all the people that are behind the camera. It takes a lot of us to put this television program together. And there you see our team for landmark cases, both the technical and the editorial team. Uh, uh, Greg Sizowitz is our studio head and all the folks who work with him on the technical side, Terry Murphy, Ben uh, O'Connell, and Nate Hurst leading uh, the, uh, and Yvette, our, our, who has been answering all your phone calls uh, all this season um, uh, and uh, making this all work for us. Thanks to everyone uh, for your help in putting this together and to our great viewers for all your questions by Twitter and phone call. Thanks for being with us this season.